Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture six, module six. A um, <clears throat> couple pieces of logistics. I uploaded the slide deck from the last lecture um, into Blackboard. So you should be able to find that attached in the lecture scroll to the bottom, in the module scroll to the bottom to the slide deck for the lecture. It'll be there. Um, also, as we talked about next week, I will not be in class. I'm going to be traveling, so I'll be out of the country, but I have a guest lecturer for you. His name is Jonathan Gasiak, who works on my team. So he's going to actually walk through an example of metric setting, a uh, trust, loyalty, advocacy, which we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to break this into three different recordings so you know where to take some logical breaks. Um, but then I'll load each of the three up into YouTube and I'll post them um, in the into Blackboard so you can see them there. Um, obviously, if you're listening to this, you've already figured that out. So that's a good thing. All right. So, um, Trust, loyalty, advocacy. But first, before we get to that, I want to talk about how we actually compete. I want to talk about some competitive models, um, some, some models that give us understanding of how competition works, and all of which I think are right, some of which you'll learn in different classes with Simon. Um, there's marketing strategy, there's business strategy, there's strategy, strategy. You know how I think about strategy, I kind of separate strategy as the things you do to motivate your people and align your people towards some common set of goals. And the tactics that we deploy are the things we go and do, the skills we build, the capabilities that we build, and the roadmap that we put together to actually produce our products and services so that we can make a profit. All those things that describe the how of the business, those are our tactics. The why, the who we serve, the problems that we solve at the higher levels, that's how we describe our strategy. That's the momentum framework. But Again, I want to start with some, some other historical models because they've all certainly contributed to my thinking on, on business strategy and business tactics. So let's start by talking about Porter's model. Um, there's a reference to his book. In the description of Blackboard, um, brilliant man, Harvard professor, so kind of hard to argue with his credentials there. But he's got the Porter's Five Forces model where he talks about at the center you have your industry competitors, your industry competitors, all competing for the same resources in the market. This is typically seen, you see it drawn like this. Um, and then you'll see that he's got potential entrance. So how do you defend against new potential entrance into the market? And he's written a couple different books on this. They're very deep heady books, lots of analysis you can do to kind of try to understand how you position yourself and how you set up defenses in your business against potential entrants um, or against substitutes, substitute products. Subst substitute um, offerings or products in the context of what it is you do. So competitive, maybe not um, in your exact industry, but other ways that people solve these problems um, that are ancillary to your industry. And then over here, he's got suppliers and where you position yourself in terms of your suppliers. Talk about vertical integration as a way to fend off having a supply chain that causes you to be less competitive um, because suppliers have bargaining power, of course. Um, and then on the other side of that, there's the buyers. So these are your customers. And they have some bargaining power as well. And understanding how you lay your, where you are in the context of your buyers and suppliers and potential entrants and substitute products. This is the Porter's, Porter's Five Forces um, model. Later on, actually introduced the sixth, and that's like government or regulatory. Um, influences that can have an impact on your positioning. So it's really the quarter six forces model. Um, so that's one of the, one of the things that, uh, like I said, a lot of thinking in this space in terms of how do you position yourself? And I think it's very useful. It's a very useful model. Um, but like George Box says, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. This is an example of that. I think this is a very powerful way to kind of look at what, how you're positioned um, I think this is more important for larger companies that have to deal with um, more complex, a more complex ecosystem than it does for smaller businesses, but it's still equally valuable. I mean, even if you're a startup, try to figure out what industry you're trying to disrupt, um, how is your product with maybe a substitute for the ways in which people are already solving these problems. Um, 
in their various industries. Yeah. Okay, so that's porters. Another one that you commonly hear about in terms of figuring out how do you compete. I love to talk about this one because I actually use an exercise based on this model in all of my workshops. When I run workshops for clients to try to figure out um, what to do next. So in this model is Albert Humphreys. Albert Humphreys. Albert Humphreys. And what he did was he discovered, hey, there's a simple little two, you know, two by two matrix you can create. Um, it's called the SWOT matrix, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats model. And it's a two by two across the top. You have now, um, you have now, and this is really historically, historically, and now, how are we positioned? And then this is about the future. Where are we going to go? And it's, these are on the left side, you have positives, things that we're good at, things that, are, that we're um, known for, so to speak. And then on the right, you have the negatives, the things that keep us up at night, things that we're not so good at. And Albert you know, used this as a strategy planning tool. And I think it's a very, very useful tool. Again, not entirely right as in terms of like, this is the only thing you would use to craft your strategy. Uh, but you see lots and lots of consultants in industry using this tool to try to set strategy or to try to drive decision-making. And I think that's very, very hard to do um, in this context because you're gonna, what you're gonna do is you're gonna fill in each of these quadrants with a bunch of subjective ideas. Um, and it's not gonna be, it's not gonna really, uh, it's not super helpful in that context, but I have found this framework to be incredibly helpful in the context of aligning a team. Here's why. If you, and this is what we do in our workshops. If you start out your thinking, if you get a group of people that you're trying to get aligned, competent, and committed, remember the three, the three ways you'll know your team is somewhat motivated. They're aligned on the purpose. They're confident in each other's skills and tools and abilities. And they're committed to that, to getting that result. Self-determination theory, one-on-one, right? Aligned, competent, committed. Um, when you have that goal in mind, the first place you should start is by taking the people in the room and trying to empty their minds. Like get rid of all of the things that they came into the room with. So if you're gonna run a workshop, or you're, gonna, you're gonna start a team down a path of innovation. The first thing you need to do is kind of cleanse their thinking, cleanse their mind of all the things they're worried about and all the things that they have up there. So I have found this to be an incredible leadership tool when you're going down any strategy, strategic planning path, because what it allows you to do is clear the room of baggage. It allows you to clear the room of baggage. So if you get everybody to think about what you're doing here. So you get everybody to talk about what are you good at? What is the team good at today? And you, you hey, we're, you know, we're really good at marketing. Um, we're really good at um, customer service. We're really good at you know, this thing, that thing, this thing. What this is doing, this is giving them this opportunity, this super, super cool opportunity to literally brag. They get the chance to brag about all the things that are going well. So they can get that off their chest. Because when you think about trying to align a group of smart people, they've all got egos. They've all got egos and they've all got good ideas. And your job as the leader is to tap into the creativity of those people. So, so to start, you need to, a lot, they all come into the room. They all come into the group, you know, storming, norming, forming. Remember in the storming mode, they all come together um, with baggage, with ideas about how they're going to do this thing and how they're going to get this idea out. They got to get this. So this gives them an opportunity to get all these positive things out. It gives them a chance to brag about the past. It gives them a chance to dream a little together. And if they have ideas, it, has, it gives them a chance to get them out. Get them out, get their ideas out and on the table so we can talk about all these ideas they have for the future, these opportunities for us to go after. The weaknesses give them, gives them an opportunity to complain. So historically, here's all the things we suck at and the things that I am fed up with. And it gives you a chance to just get it out. So you get all of these complaints out in the open they have a chance to kind of get them all out of their minds 
And then you talk about the things that keep them up at night. So these are our worries. So it's a very clean, positive, negative, history, historical, and in the future. These are the things I'm worried about. These are, keep, these, are the, I, these are the concepts, the competitive threats, whatever they are, that are keeping us up at night. And when you get clear on all of these things, you give these people the space. First of all, it's a great icebreaker. Um, you give them the space to get all of this stuff out of their heads, and something magical occurs. Like once it's down, it's on paper. You put it on the whiteboard. It's hanging up on the wall. Here's all the, here's all the things I came into the room with. Um, I want to make sure everybody recognizes that we're good at this. And this is my, I did this. This is the thing I'm responsible for. They get to brag a little. Here's my idea. Here's my idea that I'm chopping at the bit to get out. So you get it out, get the ideas out. You know what? I want to get this out. I'm really upset about these things. I want to get them out. You get them out in the open, they're out. And these are the things I'm worried about that are coming down the pipe. So we get the worries out. Now you have a clean slate. And, if you, and this is important as a workshop or as a leader to make sure everybody in the room contributes to this framework. If everybody in the room contributes, um, you're already on the right path. So, and, and it's important. So one of the workshop tactics that I found is, is to sometimes if you have introverts in the room that aren't contributing as much, or you got a couple of personalities in the room that are loud and sort of obnoxious and kind of driving a lot of the conversation behaviors, you can slow the room down by having them actually drop their ideas on notepads, sticky pads. Little sticky pads, one of the best inventions um, ever to have come across the business community. So, so go to quiet time, have people write down their threats, weaknesses, strengths, opportunities, then, then read them aloud, put them on the board. This gives everybody an opportunity to make sure you get all these ideas out. Because now you've, cleaned the, you've cleared the room, you've cleared their minds. This is really valuable. Um, and now you can start over. So you can start to work on the next generation strategy together for the clean slate. Right. So that's SWOT. That's, that's called the SWOT analysis. I'm sure most of you, hopefully, if you've been in the business community long enough, you've gone through a SWOT exercise or you've thought about it. But this is, this is what I think is useful. I think it's useful for clearing the room so that you can now start from scratch, building a powerful vision, like a you know, real powerful vision with clearly articulated understanding of who we're serving, what problems we're solving, how we're going to measure our success. Um, and you can get people motivated. Based on that. All right. Another framework I want to talk about that I absolutely love, and we use this one, we use this exercise sometimes in our workshops too, is after you've gone through the exercise of identifying your consumer's top concerns, or we, use the, we would use the Hoshin Star to do a map of, um, of their top concerns. Again, this being an exercise in understanding those first order problems. You guys remember the, remember the first order problems down here, like using the Hoshin Star, these are the top five problems, the top five concerns that our customers are coming to us with. Um, I found it to be super useful to um, take those concerns in priority order and map them in the jobs to be done framework. So jobs to be done is a framework that's, uh, that was developed, let me write it up here, JTBD, it's commonly referred to, or jobs to be done. This is Clayton Christensen's work. He passed away last year, unfortunately. He's another Harvard professor, PhD. He's done a lot of writing and reading, or a lot of writing and research on, uh, on leadership and innovation. And he's got this framework where instead of thinking about the problems we're solving in our context or in, the ter in terms of like how, um, how we can necessarily solve them, Let's think about them in terms of how the customer would phrase the job that they're hiring the thing to do. And, you know, he's got a lot of examples. The most common one might be the hammer or the drill and the drill bit, right? You don't hire a drill bit um, to fit into your drill. You actually hire the drill bit to make a hole. It's the hole that you're buying. The job that you're, that you're buying is to have this hole made. That's what you go shopping for a drill bit for. Or he uses the milkshake example in his book. Um, on, on innovation, he uses a milkshake. You, like you, a lot of people were going to McDonald's in the morning and ordering a milkshake. So he's trying to figure out why. Why is that? Well, what's the job that the milkshake's doing? Well, a lot of these people are commuting, so they're commuting, and they're looking for something that will be fulfilling to them. So they're looking for something fulfilling, and they're looking for something that you know it's going to take a while. Um, it's satisfying, it's fulfilling, and it's going to take a while 
for it to uh, for them to finish it. Um, so they, you know, there's there's a bunch of uh, jobs that this milkshake is doing. It's entertaining them for a long period of time while they're in the car, and it's it's also um, fulfilling their need for to fill, put something in their belly before they go to work, so to speak. So understanding from the customer's perspective, the psychology behind what job are they hiring this, you to do is a way to frame um, these problems, these first order problems like we talked about. Um, if you look up in the, over here, if you look up in, on the ch chart there. So these first order problems, we've, we've prioritized them. So here's the job to be done. And you list out the jobs, job one, job two, job three, job four, job five. You know, in, in the context of the case study that we did, you know, they, they want to save money. Um, they want to be fashionable. They want, you know, you have all these jobs, these problems, these concerns that we're meeting. Phrase them in the customer's uh, terminology. Like they want to be fashionable. No, not really. What they want to do is they want to appear to their peers to be fashionable. So I want to appear to be fashionable. And here's the key. Like they've all, all of these jobs, if you, it doesn't matter if you're starting something new or um, you've been in business for a while, whatever job you've identified, whatever concern or problem you're solving for your customer, they're solving that problem today somehow. So today they're solving that problem in some way. And this is why I think, you know, in the case, in the case study that we study, understanding what problems we are solving really well today, those strengths from the SWOT analysis, like if we if we can identify that, we don't want to disrupt that. Like it's that's something you don't want to disrupt. If you're doing a good job today, you don't want to change something that's working. But there are other problems, clearly, in, in the case of the of that store, you know, of that chain of stores, there are other problems, the industry is changing around them and they're going somewhere else. So you have to understand how are they solving those problems today. And there's some way in which they're solving those problems today. Okay, tomorrow, if we want to succeed, we need to look at all of these problems that we're solving and we need to figure out a way that's gonna solve them better than how they're doing it today. We're gonna, we gotta find a way to solve this problem better or e at least equally as well as how they're solving it today so that we can tip the scale, so that we can tip the scale into them choosing our service over whatever way they're using to solve the problem today, okay? And you can use this as a framework to kind of brainstorm out, how could we um, solve the problems better? And then this will give you a list of initiatives to go and do, to get to go and work on. Um, because if you're not solving the problem better than they're doing it today, and by, and by better, I mean with less effort, with more joy, um, going, back to, going back to this, uh, slide deck here in some way that is solves not only solves the problem today like the, the core first order problem but also solves maybe one of these higher level problems as well right so connecting them to others maybe uh, making them feel like they're a part of something bigger uh, making them feel a little smarter than they than they started out you know making them feel incredibly safe uh, making them feel relevant self-actualization like figuring this out is a key way um, to really connect with your customers. So if you if you plot out, how are they, and think about all of your case studies, the things that you're working on today, or the, the business plans that you guys are working on today. Your, your companies are solving all of these problems today, or competitors are solving them better than you are. And your job is to come up with a better way tomorrow. You always have to be thinking about what, how, what can we do better tomorrow, solve the same problem, but solve it in a slightly higher level way using the second order um, construct or actually an innovation. And this is this is where we're looking for these innovations. And this is a cool tool um, to use with your with your teams to kind of force the ideation process um, for solving these problems. And again, not knowing how they're doing it today or the various ways, because in some cases they're solving the problem in multiple ways today. Um, not knowing what those are, you're kind of flying blind. So that's Chris, uh, Clayton Christensen's Jobs to be Done framework. Um, I've obviously, if you know anything about Clayton's work, I've obviously modified it um, significantly to make it work for me, but um, by adding this, this sort of challenge.
construct in here so that we understand the job to be done. But his language around job to be done, I think is brilliant and, and really making yourself, forcing yourself to get into the customer's shoes as you're defining um, the problems that you're trying to solve. All right, so that's a framework. Um, job to be done. Cool. Now I want to talk about I want to talk about yeah. So in my humblest of opinions, all of these frameworks and models are great. They're useful. They help us kind of get insights into how we can maybe set ourselves apart or maintain our advantage. Um, but the reality is the only way we really compete, I believe, um, in the long run, the only way we set up a sustainable competitive environment for our business is through, is through experience. It's through um, creating experience. I'm gonna prove that, I'm gonna try to prove that to you. So another model of framework, you probably heard the five P's of marketing. Um, there's a bunch of these frameworks around how do you competitively position yourself? I think they're all, again, I think they're all right. They're all good and they're all useful. Um, however, I think the best thing you can do is think about the experience that you're producing for your customers and for your employees for that matter. All right, so let's walk through this framework. So the trade-off triangle, this is another one that I learned um, at Simon and a bunch of other places. If you've been in the business community long enough, you're gonna see this triangle um, probably five different times in five different ways. Like in the software industry, we call it the iron triangle. And it's always described sort of the same way. They say there's three things that we're competing on here and you have to make it, it's a trade-off and you have to make choices. And, and the trade-offs are quality, speed or convenience um, and cost or price, right? And people, Trade these they look at these trade-offs and this is how we make all of our decisions um, as buyers. However, I don't think it really works that way. I think, especially if you think, um, put, just put yourself in the mindset of like online retail as an example, because um, that's, the, that's the Harvard case study that we've, we've been talking about kind of throughout the course. Um, that's not really the way it works. Like all of these things are certainly true. Like if you produce a bad product, you are super slow and if you, are expensive, um, you're obviously, you gotta find the right balance of these things. But in the world of the internet, some things have changed. And the first thing that I see that's changed is that it's really not optional to compete in a, in a situation because we have information transparency now that we never had before. So in the last you know 20 years or so, if you suck at what you do, there's no place to hide anymore. Like you can't market your way around how bad your products are and sell a bunch of things. Like if you suck, the whole world knows you suck. We have, we have platforms for everything. Um, for reviewing everything, think Zappos, think Amazon. Like these companies have built empires around, basically around peer review, right? So empires around peer review. Like if, if you're, and we all do this. Like if you, if you go and look on Amazon, one of the first things you probably do when you're looking through reviews is you scroll right to the bottom. You want to see what you want to see what negative. And Amazon and Zappos both did studies and published studies on this a while back. People don't read the positive reviews for the most part. They go straight to the negatives and they read the negatives. They want to know what's going to go wrong. And the reason is Daniel Kahneman, one on one, thinking fast and slow. We have a natural tendency to value loss more than we value gain. Humans value loss more than they value gain. So this is what this is what drives this behavior. Like, you can't be low quality because the the whole world has a bullhorn called the internet, and everything is like become more and more and more transparent. So you can't get away with being low quality. Um, you have to be somewhat high quality, at least high quality enough that you're perceived to be a reasonable quality, or you're out of the game. What about slowness? What about speed? What do we all have in our pockets these days? We all have this magical thing called a cell phone. And we don't even have to push a button. We can just talk to it. And we can find a competitive solution to whatever it is you do. So 
speed is, is, is very hard to use speed or convenience as a competitive advantage anymore. Like you have to be fast. You have to be convenient. It's like, it's a necessary part of competition um, today, especially in the online world. What about price? How does price work? Can we compete on price? Aren't we all competing on price? Isn't it a race to zero? Um, if you read the book by Chris Anderson, uh, free, it's a pretty incredible treatise on how he thinks the price of everything is eventually gonna go to zero. Um, but here's the deal. The internet has changed how we price, changed how we think about price because there's so much transparency. Like there, you can't hide things inside of your price. And the more you complexify your price, the harder it is to sell. Like simple pricing works better. Decomplexifying your pricing works better. And making it making things a little more transparent helps you sell. You know, and and it's not like we're actually competing on price, really. Um, if we were, you wouldn't see companies like Apple and Starbucks being successful, right? So we have price transparency. Yes, the prices of commodities are all on a race to zero. I truly believe that. So how do you decommoditize anything that you're doing? Well, let's look at these two case studies. Let's look at the example of Apple or, or Amazon or Starbucks or any, any company that's thriving. And you're going to find a pattern that exists. And that pattern is pretty amazing. It's pretty simple. Like these are companies, if you ask Howard Schultz, and he's been, he's been quoted as saying this, Howard Schultz, if you're going to spend a dollar on marketing, where would you put it? And he doesn't spend any money on marketing. Look at, look at how much Starbucks advertises. You ever seen a Starbucks advertisement anywhere? No. He said he would put it in the customer's experience before he put it into any advertising. Um, I think Disney's done a very similar thing. And Apple, Apple, yeah, they do some advertising, but um, they really focus on the customer experience. Everything from the opening of the box, you know, the making sure that experience is amazing to the store experience, um, to focusing on the platform experience, like the user experience of the customer, like starting with the customer and working backwards with the technology, all to serve the customer experience. And this is what I believe. Because in the words of Maya Angelou, we've talked about this before, people will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And if you want the, if you want to have the right to charge a higher price, then you have to focus on producing a world-class experience, no matter what product or service you offer. Wegmans is another great example of this. Like focus on, focus on producing a world-class experience. Because the reality is, yes, quality matters, speed matters, and the price matters significantly. The features, whether or not your product is blue or red or comes in large and small or extra large, all of these other factors, they all matter. Of course they matter. But they only matter to the degree at which they make your customer feel something. So I call this concept sort of the experience puzzle. And understanding all of the components that go into the actual customer's experience, that's what's actually important. That's what actually adds value. So um, focus on experience. It's really the only thing you have. And now I'm going to prove that to you um, with a, a treatise on, on trust and how trust works. Uh, but before the, we do that, let's jump to the flip chart. Um, and I want to talk about, I want to go back to the concept of culture. Um, you guys remember early on, I think lecture one even, lecture one or two, we talked about how does culture get built? And I use this, I use this framework here to explain to you the power of words in terms of leadership. And I can't emphasize this enough. Like our job is to create a culture in which um, we have values, beliefs, and principles, mantras, and sayings, all that support each other, stories that get told with heroes and villains, art, artifacts, rituals, symbols ceremonies, secret handshakes. These are all the components of culture. And they only matter because they influence the conversations that are occurring when we're not in the hallways as the leaders. But if, if, if the things we're doing as leaders aren't influencing the conversations that are occurring in the hallways, what are we doing as leaders? You know, going all the way back, remember, it's our job as leaders in any context, in any context, if you're leading your church group, your sports team, any of these, Remember, this, this is the job of leadership. It's to cause more caring to occur, 
right? It's to cause more caring to occur and to be more influential, to cause influence. But it's not just about your ability. It's not just about your ability to cause more caring or your ability to cause more influence. Remember, it's not. It's actually about your ability to scale influence and your ability to scale caring through others. Not even just the people that you directly interact with. Like what the best leaders do is they figure out how, how to take these, how to take the caring and the and the influence through their words, through their language, through the mantras, through the values, through the stories that get told, through the products and services and the service delivery channels, all the things that happen in the art of the business and that art arc, and scale it not not through yourself, but through others. Which means you have to learn to become a coach and you have to learn to become a teacher. And you have to learn how to power up the people around you to power up the people around them, to power up the people around them. That's how you scale leadership. And the, really the only powerful tool we have, the thing I'm trying to sell to you here is the, the most powerful tool we have to do that is the words we choose to make important and the words we choose to not make important. The values, the beliefs, all of this stuff, all the core stuff that goes into the building of our culture over time. All right, so let's focus on some words. So before we do that, um, let's focus on some words, but let's talk about conversations and how it all works. So if everything happens in the context of conversations, we have to remember, so all of the things that we're, we're talking about here, all of these, think of this as the, you know, the layers of the cultural onion kind of feeding, these, this, is, this describes our history. So we often think of culture in terms of our history, but the words, the values, the mantras, the beliefs, the stories, the um, art, artifacts, the conversations, we have all of this history. This is our history. History. It's the where we come from. Yeah. And as leaders, what we want to do is we want to create a better, more powerful go-to, this place that we're going to. And we have to figure out how we're going to get there. So we want to go to this place in the future. I like to think of it sort of as a reverse crescent. And inside of this crescent, we have, a, we have an assembly of people that trust us. And we have a, a smaller assembly of people who are loyal to us. And we have a smaller assembly, assembly of people in the middle that are, that are advocates in some context. Um, Think of it like a Venn diagram. I have that drawn up somewhere. I'll make sure this gets included in your deck. Um, it looks something like this, right? So, so we have this universe of people, the prospects, and we want to we want to draw them in in the future. We want to expand the number of people who trust us, expand the number of people who are advocates, expand the number of people um, over time. Right, so this is our goal, and that's where we want to go to. And the only way that occurs is in the now. So right now, in this moment, as we're leading, there's conversations that are occurring. There's conversations that are occurring, and this is called on. This is like ontology 101 here, but we need to we need to make sure we're we're looking at the history, crafting the stories that we're being that we're telling our people crafting our language so that through conversations, we power the future. And we lead through our language. We lead through the, the things that we produce in the context of our culture, but we lead through our language. This is really important to understand. We lead through our language. We lead by speaking. Um, and the more powerful we, powerfully we learn to communicate, it's one of the 21 leadership skills that I went through with you guys in the last lecture. Um, we lead to communicate, we learn to communicate, we get better at it, uh, the more powerful we become as leaders. Okay. So I'm going to do a quick review here real quick of a couple things. I actually went through the art, the work of some of the constructs I gave to you guys last week, I didn't have built out in slides. So I went through the work of building them and I did post them. So you'll see them um, in module five. But I want to review them again real quick with you. 
My slide deck is a little out of control here. Okay, so leadership behaviors, remember this. So the, the four, um, let me turn this off real quick. Oops, there we go. The four, the four quadrant model here, self and others. I went through this with you guys in the very beginning. Um, self awareness, self influence, other awareness, other influence, or regulation, um, depending on how you think about it. Um, I, what I did was I took those 21 leadership behaviors from the Door Institute and I categorized them into one of these four quadrants. Um, one of these four quadrants. So if you remember, you guys seem to have a lot of interest in that. So I took the time to do this. The um, first quadrant, self-awareness, purposefulness, purposefulness in terms of mission, purposefulness in terms of uh, values, beliefs, principles, the things that you're willing to tolerate. Here's an important leadership. Here's an important leadership um, lesson that I had to learn many, many times. You get what you tolerate. You get what you tolerate. So if you have a stated value and you have people that are not behaving in accordance with that standard value that you proclaim is important to the organization and is important to you, yeah? If you have people that are not behaving in accordance with that value, and you tolerate that behavior, you will get more of that behavior. Toleration is equivalent to award. It's equivalent to uh, rewarding it. All right, so purposefulness, self-confidence. We talked about this framework of confidence and competence, right? And, and uh, the difference between too much ego and um, imposter syndrome and how after you've actually built some competence in the domain, you're constantly writing that line of, of ego and imposter syndrome. And it's healthy to be on that line. And like I said, all entrepreneurs I know exaggerate sometimes their capabilities. And, and if they didn't, they wouldn't really achieve much. Like you have to believe that you can do things better. You have to believe that you can grow. You have to believe that there's, you know, this possibility exists that maybe other people don't see even if you don't know for sure how you're gonna achieve it. The self-confidence thing I think is really, really important. Um, and then emotional awareness, like this is the fight, flight, freeze, facade stuff that we talked about, if you remember. Like this is, this is the, um, if, if you're in that reaction mode, you're probably making bad decisions. It's the behavioral economics stuff, like the fast brain versus the slow brain. And, the more aware you are of what state of mind you're in, whether you're using that limbic decision-making system or you're using the prefrontal cortex, the, the thinking brain, um, this is an important leadership skill. All right, the next one, self-regulation. So, or I'm sorry, did I get this right? Yeah, self-regulation. So self-influence and self-regulation. Actually, once you recognize the behavior, it's a completely different thing to change your own behavior to actually learn how to breathe and take a step back when your amygdala is responding, to know, you know, know when to stay quiet and listen, and to know how to balance your time. Like one of the things they found in leadership um, with the Door Institute is like, good leaders tend to have a balanced life. They have hobbies, they have diverse hobbies that are outside of just the work that they do. They have, they have a real life and they have a family life in a lot of cases. So it's, it's very important that you, that you exhibit balance and you exhibit good time management. So you model that behavior for the people that work with you and for you, people that you serve, that you call your employees. All right, another one is decision-making. Like you have to be decisive. Even sometimes when you're not sure it's the right decision, you have to make a decision and act. Because if you don't, if you don't experiment, if you don't try things, you're not gonna make progress. So every now and then, you just got to make a decision, even though you're not entirely sure. But great leaders are decisive. The next one is this task completion, perseverance, getting things done, like not being distracted, not being that shiny object syndrome, um, you know, ADHD like me, um, that's that's constantly going off in another direction. This is this is one that I've had to work on too. This like, hey, I'm gonna set about this task, I'm gonna set this goal, I'm gonna actually achieve it before I move on to the next thing. Um, task completion, perseverance, very important. 
Other awareness, upper right hand quadrant, cross cultural resourcefulness. Like I've tried in 17 different ways to show you mathematically um, and with examples of great leadership why it's important to be cross culturally resourceful. Like expand your spheres of caring. Lecture one, right? Great leaders expand the, the, the spheres of caring in the context of the work that they're doing um, and the spheres of influence. And to do this, you need to value other opinions. And, and one of the traits of great leaders is they value um, diverse, as diverse as possible opinions, even when they're opposing opinions to their own. Um, Cross-cultural research ones. All right, the next one is ethical responsibility. And, and this is like, you know, it sounds altruistic, um, but it's really important that you have a core set of values like integrity um, that you take the time to define that you, that you authentically value and that you model so that others that you're leading model the same behaviors. Um, empathic engagement. So knowing how to read others and read their emotions so that you can respond appropriately. I went through a whole model with you guys um, from Kim Scott on radical candor and some other strategies for, for helping you figure out how to communicate. I gave you a, a mechanism for feedback uh, management that uses self-determination theory. I think these are important leadership skills. If you wanna create an environment of innovation, these are great things to be working on. All right, next one, other influence. Team building, great leaders are good at team building and morale, rallying the troops, understanding morale, and then influencing the morale by providing things like hope and optimism in the right situations and enough healthy skepticism when um, the time calls for that as well. The next one's creating win wins. We went through polarities and understanding how to understand, how to, how to articulate when you've got a polarity that needs to be dealt with. When you have two competing things that you want, but you can't have both, there's trade-offs. Use a polarity map to kind of figure out how do I minimize the negative effects to both and maximize the positive effects for both. Move towards the middle. Um, you remember unity thrives and division always dies. So unity thrives, division dies and suffers. So we wanna to get to a point, and this is what leaders know, and this is what leaders are, really good leaders are good at, figuring out um, how to manage polarities. Um, delegation. We didn't talk too much about that. There's a the Eisenhower framework for delegation. Like if it's urgent and important, you know, you do it. Um, if it's important but not urgent, you know, you might want to give that to someone else. You know, there's there's different frameworks for that, but becoming good at delegation is an important leadership skill. Um, negotiation, I talked a little bit about um, never split the difference, Chris Voss being a great book on negotiation. You know, there's, there's plenty of uh, Dale Carnegie courses available to teach you how to negotiate better. Um, but this is an important leadership skill. But developing others, we've talked about that. Other influence, like causing others to grow and learn. We talked deeply about growing your capacity um, and your capabilities. We use the competence curve and we use some other, um, I give you that matrix for growth to show through behaviors how people are growing. Um, you could use that matrix for yourself. You could actually use these 21, you could put these 21 leadership attributes um, into a matrix for yourself to make sure that you're constantly growing your own leadership skills. And then this one, which I told you was a, a problem for me, this willingness to engage in conflict. Um, you'll notice, by the way, that these are in different a different order than I gave them to you um, in the lecture last week. And that's because I actually organized them into this chart so that it was a little bit, maybe a little bit more memorable for you or to give you some guidance on how to communicate it. Um, and then growth and learning, I think involves still the influence and regulation of both yourself and others. Um, so I put the growth and learning category from the Door Institute into both of these quadrants. This is about connecting ideas and actually causing more ideas to occur. Connecting ideas, making them useful. Having the vitality, oops, sorry. The vitality, initiative and drive to get things done. So this is about um, passion. The authentic love of learning. The great leaders have an authentic, lifelong obsession with learning. And this is something that I've found to be true across my leadership circles. Like almost every great leader that I know reads a lot of books. Not all of them, it's not a universal truth, but many, many of them are voracious readers. They love to um, go to conferences and, and listen to speakers. And they, they, many of them belong to peer groups. This is something I highly recommend for all of you. Join a peer group. 
a, a group of peers that you can bounce each other off of, uh, ideas off of each other, bounce learning off of each other, learn to teach something so that you can teach them something and then expect them to teach you something. Having a group of local of mentors that are about at your level, I think is, is valuable. And then having a group of mentors that maybe are people you aspire to be more like, um, that's really valuable. All right, so authentic love of learning. And then the last thing I think is one of the most powerful thing leaders do, and this is what I've been trying to give you some tools on, it's vision casting, the use of symbolism, the use of hope and optimism, like causing people to understand and clarify the visions um, for the thing that you're trying to lead in any context for any group of people, um, understanding who you're serving, what problems you're solving and how you're gonna measure your success, what the painted picture of the future is gonna look like. This is vision casting. Um, and these are these skills of great leaders. So I put them into this um, format for you simply so that you have this tool um, when you leave the class, kind of think about your own leadership. I also took the accountability for a learning curve and I turned it into a chart here. Um, so I put this in the in the um, slide deck for you guys as well. Remember we talked about psychological safety, the relationship between creating a safe environment, being super safe, so people have all sorts of safety to learn, um, to be free, to come up with ideas, to challenge the status quo, blah, 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 um, versus accountability for learning. Because if you don't have any accountability for growth and learning, um, frankly, if, if your vision isn't powerful enough and they're, or they're not aligned enough to it, because remember the fishbone diagram in terms of like people's motivation. People have varying levels of motivation on any given day. Oh, I keep doing that. They have varying levels of motivation about any given task on any given day. And it's your job to, to maximize their motivation in the context of the work that you're trying to do together. It's your job to maximize their motivation in the context that you're trying to do together. So you, and you, as an organizational leader, you have to ensure that your organization's constantly growing. And your organization cannot grow if the people don't grow. All right, so some experiences you'll, you'll see or some um, symptoms you'll see when people are not growing is that they'll feel a little too comfortable up here and you won't get growth. And vice versa, if you put too much stress on the learning, if you put too much accountability, um, that, that may shut them down as well. So you have to find the right level of accountability to how to hold them accountable for things that they can learn. Again, this goes along with Mikhail Chichemni High's work on flow. Make sure, making sure that you provide enough of a challenge, um, but it's not too easy so that they spend more time in flow, um, optimally performing. And I think somebody pointed out to me as I was de demonstrating this in another meeting, that there's on the line, in this line, um, between comfort and stress, you get apathy and you'll feel apathy and resistance. So this is kind of a tool for you to kind of look at your team, your organization, or the people on your team, to try to figure out, help you figure out what are we experiencing should we hold them a little more accountable? Um, you know, in my organization, I found that a quarterly cadence is probably the, about the right amount of time um, for accountability for growth. If people aren't growing on a quarterly basis, we got a problem. Um, I'd like to see them growing month to month, like adding some new skills um, in, in a month to month scenario. But the reality is it's better to study it like on a rolling average over a quarter, um, at least in my world. I think every, every business ecosystem is gonna look a little different. Um, but this is this is an important concept. All right, so with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop this recording, and I'll come back and I'll do another recording um, for trust. We'll get started with trust.